This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. Today we have an overtime service call. It's about 4.30 in the afternoon, I think, maybe 5 o'clock. We've got a walk-in cooler that's not maintaining temperatures right now. Uh, when I walked up, the condensing unit was not running. It's on their back dock. And then when I walked in, I literally just heard the, the temperature controller call and the solenoid valve open. One of the first things that I noticed, eh, I don't know if this is going to pick it up. It's not, but the evaporator coil is filthy. This is a ceiling mounted coil, so it draws the air through the fan guards and blows it out. So oftentimes, people will see the evaporator coil and think it's clean, but it's actually filthy. So, uh, you can kind of see in there. It's, it's as uh, Dave would say, it's a plug -o -bug -o. So, But I don't know, again, I have a feeling because the moment that I walked in here, I heard the solenoid valve call that we're gonna have a temperature controller issue. I have a feeling it's satisfying too early maybe. It's just a Russell condensing unit out here. Uh, let's see what we got going on. Probably got a lot of wind noise there, but we've got a clear sight glass. So we're gonna take the cover off and gauge up, check out the defrost clock, go through the whole thing. One thing, just kind of do a visual. Look at that piece of cardboard back there. Today's a really windy day, and I wonder how easy it is for that to happen. That's another thing that I don't like. It was really windy and really hot today, and that's sitting right there. All right, well, we're still gonna go through everything. So the unit's satisfied again. I'm gonna put a thermometer in the box, but I'm still just continuing my visual. Uh, the unit says almost the correct time, so I don't see a problem with that. It does have an excessive defrost though. For a walk-in cooler, way too much defrost. We want about 20 minutes at the most for a walk-in cooler. You can't shut a walk-in cooler off for 40 minutes at two o'clock in the afternoon. That's no bueno, so that's not good either. We turned on at 39, right at 40 degrees is what it turned on at. Refrigerant pressures are not looking hideous. Um, so I'm measuring 39 right now. We're not worried about supply temperatures right now. Let's go ahead and set this guy up. Let's just call it a package. Let's go ahead and call this our target temperature is uh, 40 degrees. Our target TD is 10 degrees. And our minimum condensing temperature, minimum condensing pressure. We're not going to worry about that right now because so we are running a clear sight glass we're looking good there we're just looking at our uh, our box temp see what we turn on and off at so I thought it was a thermostat issue because but no it's not looking like it Condenser fan motor number one is running 0.4 and is allowed to run 0.43, so we're good on that. Condenser fan motor number two is allowed to run 1.1 amps, so I did hear like a bearing noise earlier coming from one of those motors, but they're both operating correctly, so we're just going to keep watching. All right, this thing is cycling where it's supposed to be. It's bringing the box down to 36 degrees, coming back on at 39 degrees. So don't see a problem with the temp control at this time. Refrigerant pressures look good. Sight glass is clear. We're actually satisfied right now. Two things that I think might be the problem. That piece of cardboard, that's right there. Could have been sucked up against the condenser. It was a very windy day. We have the Santa Ana winds here. We had 70 mile an hour winds, gusts, and they've kind of died down, but stuff blows around like crazy when that happens. We have an auto reset dual pressure control. So if it did go off on high head pressure, it would reset itself. Um, 
Second thing is, is right around the time that they called me, two-ish, is when the unit would have been in a defrost for 30 to 40 minutes. That could account for high temperatures also. That 30 to 40 minutes in the middle of the day is too long, by the way, so we shortened that down. Um, we're gonna come back more than likely tomorrow, clean the evaporator, and then we'll reevaluate everything, but I think we're gonna be okay. I'm gonna watch it for a few more minutes because we're dropping in temperature significantly right now. It's probably about, well, I guess I can tell you what it is because I have it on my thermometer. 66 degrees right now. Uh, when I got here, it was probably 70s. So um, I just want to make sure that we don't start flashing on the sight glass, like a low charge issue. So we returned uh, next morning and right when I walk up, the unit is actually warm and temp again. It's uh, 41 degrees outside and the unit is short cycling. So it's actually going to end up being low on charge. And what's happening is the head pressure control valve more than likely is bypassing so we have a cold liquid drain coming out of the condenser we have a warm discharge line and what's happening is, is it's trying to bypass the condenser or essentially flood the condenser regulate the flow coming out of the condenser and then feed a vapor refrigerant directly into the receiver but the problem is is that we need a, a liquid uh, liquid seal essentially so we need a certain amount of winter charge is what we call it sitting in the receiver at all times so that way if the head pressure control valve ever does bypass because when it does bypass it blows vapor into the top of the, the receiver so it requires that extra winter charge or the liquid seal sitting in the receiver extra refrigerant whatever you want to call it so that way when the vapor pushes down it pushes the liquid to the expansion valve because our expansion valve uh, needs 100% liquid refrigerant going to it and we don't have that right now so the unit is actually short cycling so we're gonna go ahead and add some refrigerant and uh, get the charge correct and then finish going through the unit cleaning it up and all that good stuff as you can see it looks like we're pumping down but if you look at the sight glass there's little water drops or liquid droplets in there and what's happening is, is we're trying to the system just doesn't have enough refrigerant so we're gonna start by adding it. So the next time it turns on, I'm gonna go ahead and put a little refrigerant in there. We're gonna to try to get it to where it'll actually run. And then after that point, we're gonna to have to figure out how much is the correct amount of charge. So if I go ahead and clear this sight glass today, right now, I will know that we have enough refrigerant for the head pressure control valve to flood if our temperature only gets to 41 degrees for the rest of the year. Now we're in San Bernardino, it gets pretty cold we can probably hit the 20s here so we do need to add extra refrigerant to the system so that way when it does bypass below 40 degrees we still have a clear sight glass so so i'm adding a little refrigerant to the system right now all i'm doing is metering my ball valve we're adding liquid refrigerant don't want to overload it. We're not going to overload it because we're feeding through um, Schrader ports. It's going to be fine. But still, you want to monitor and make sure that you don't add too much and you know slug liquid back to the compressor. But in our situation, we're going through Schrader valve, Schrader valve, and through a low loss hose. Trust me, we're not going to feed too much refrigerant to this system right now. Um, so we're just going to keep doing it, adding gas until the uh, system will stabilize and start running and then we'll take some temperature measurements once I get it running. Okay, now we're getting to a more stable level. I've added just shy of three pounds of gas to the system and it is actually running now. We have 166 head pressure. We have a 30 back pressure. That's a seven degree evaporator. We're still low on charge. Okay, but we're gonna let it run for a little bit and just see what happens, okay? Okay, now you're gonna have to visualize this right now. So, suck, don't pay attention to the names, okay? But suction line temp is on the discharge line, discharge line, 165 degrees. Liquid line temp is on the liquid drain coming out the bottom of the condenser. So you notice my discharge line is 165. The liquid drain coming out the bottom of the condenser right there is 46 degrees. So now what I wanna do is take this and put it on the liquid line and show you what the temperature is. Look at 83 degrees. Okay, so it went from 46 degrees to 83 degrees because this valve is currently regulating the flow because our head pressure in the system 
is below the bypass pressure. The bypass pressure is about 180 PSI and this valve will start bypassing. So we are bypassing the condenser right now. Discharge line's hot, liquid drain is cool, liquid line is warm. Sight glass, which I think we might just be satisfying right now. Yeah, I think we're satisfying. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and calculate the flooded charge for this unit. Now this is an interesting situation. We knew it was low on charge. I added refrigerant and I cleared the sight glass, but it only has enough refrigerant for a 41 degree day. We are gonna calculate flooded charge for a zero degree day. That's an extreme low, extreme low. Probably won't ever get to zero, but we're gonna be safe, okay? So we're gonna calculate for a zero degree day. So we are gonna calculate the extra amount of refrigerant. There's another way that you can do it where you take a heat producing device, pump down the receiver, move the heat producing device up and down, but I wanna show the proper way using Sporlin's 90-30-1 method, which is actually right here, and it tells you how to do it. It's really not that difficult. So we're gonna go ahead. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna measure the straight length of the pipe. We're gonna find out the diameter of the pipe, which is half inch, and we're gonna count the return bins. And then we're gonna do some calculations and figure out how much refrigerant we would need to properly flood this condenser. Here's what we know. We have R22 refrigerant, our condenser tube diameter is half inch. Our measured condenser tube length is 33 inches. That's the straight section of condenser tubes. The total condenser tubes counted are 48. The total counted return bins are 46. Our return bend equivalent length is 0 0.250. And our density factor for R22 refrigerant at zero degrees Fahrenheit is 0 0.100. Now that we have all that information, we could just simply get our calculator and do the calculations. So we have a 33 inch measured tube length and we need to convert that into feet first, okay? Because that's 33 inches and we need a foot measurement. So we're gonna take 33 divided by 12 and we're gonna come up with 2.75 feet. That makes the calculator math a little bit easier. Then we take the 2.75 feet times the total amount of tubes that we counted, which was 48 tubes equals 132 feet of straight pipe. Then we gotta calculate the total equivalent length of our return bins, okay? So 46 return bins times the equivalent length calculation of 0 0.250 equals 11.5 feet of total pipe in our return bins, okay? Then we're just gonna add those two numbers together. 132 feet plus 11.5 feet equals 143.5 feet of measured tubing, including the return bins. Now we're gonna take our density factor of R22 refrigerant at zero degrees and multiply that times our 143.5 feet. And we come up with 14.35 pounds of extra refrigerant needed, and that is R22 refrigerant, for this condenser to properly flood at a zero degree ambient in the wintertime. Now, we're not done yet because I cleared my sight glass at 41 degrees. So we're simply gonna do this calculation again, find out what the difference between the density factor number at 40 degrees versus zero degrees, and whatever that difference is, that's how much extra refrigerant my system is gonna need because I cleared my sight glass at 41 degrees ambient, but I want that sight glass to stay clear all the way down to zero degrees ambient. So hopefully that makes sense for you guys. So we got the fan guards and fan motor or blades off. You can't take the motors out without dropping the, the um, pan. So we're gonna do this with them in place. But look at that, look at how dirty that is. What we do is we brush it off first, then we'll put a cleaner on there and go through it like that. So we had a hard time trying to brush this through the fan. So I'm still gonna put it back up when I rinse it, but we just hinged the coil. So now I can brush it really quick and do a better job of just brushing this this thing is just hammered so this way i can get in here and just go boom 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 and it's not falling in the drain pan i'd rather it just fall on the ground and not be as worried about it getting stuck in the drain pan so but again i'm not going to apply water yet just because i don't want it dripping all over me we're going to brush the dry stuff off first and then go from there normally i don't want to use any harsh chemicals but i had to use new bright because this grease is just so thick so you're gonna get it rinsed off now. So it's still not perfect, but it's so much better than it was. But this coil is also disintegrating, like the fins are just deteriorating in it. 
So this is a mess. We're cleaning these again. You can only do so much. I got cleaner in there too. We just rinsed it, but this drain is plugged up right now. And it's connected to the other walk-in coil right here, but then it's also connected to their walk-in freezer drain over there. What a mess, and then it runs out that way. All right, it has been some time. Um, took us a couple hours. It's now one o'clock in the afternoon, and we started this morning about 7.30, so it's been taking some time to get this thing cleaned. I had another tech with me, two ceiling-mounted coils that were in horrible shape that haven't been cleaned in a very long time, so. And then it was just like one thing after another. In the middle of that, went to go turn this one back on, it wouldn't run, bad disconnect, we'll come back and do that. Um, couldn't find the breaker to shut off the evaporator fan motors, had to unwire it hot. It was just like one of the drains plugged up. So anyways, just got the evaporator fans all put back together, everything's good, drains are clear. We're gonna turn this guy on. I had added four pounds earlier for the, uh, the winter charge, so that way this unit can run. Uh, at about, I think I set it up for about zero degrees, yeah. So it can run at zero degrees. Um, everything is uh, looking good so far, so I'm gonna fire it up and see what happens. All right, now that we've fired everything back up, you can see that my evaporator temperature and or my suction pressure are much better now. The, the targets that Measure Quick is getting, or giving me, I'm actually meeting, okay? And that's because we cleaned the evaporator coil and increased the airflow across the evaporator coil. Also, our outdoor ambient temperature has significantly increased. I'll scroll that over right now and you'll see. And everything else seems to be checking out okay. One quick check, now we have airflow. I can actually feel it. When I walk in the door, I get blasted with air from blowing right down into there. I mean, the box is coming down to temp brilliantly. So we are good to go, everything is good. Hopefully I didn't confuse the heck out of you guys and hopefully that kind of makes a little sense to you. Um, you know, one thing to understand is, is that my videos are in the field and they're not prepared. You know, so I didn't really go into that thinking, hey, I'm going to do a presentation on a head pressure control valve. I just kind of utilized what was in front of my face. So that's why, you know, everything is not perfectly said and everything, but I think you got to get the gist. Okay. Now I did do the, um, the calculations out in the field. But then I just came back into the studio rather than showing a piece of paper and just typed them out on a PowerPoint thing and threw the slides up there, okay? Um, the important thing to understand is, is the purpose of the head pressure control valve. The head pressure control valve is there to raise the condensing temperature or the head pressure of the system to help to maintain a pressure differential, one side of the expansion valve and the other side of the expansion valve, the pressure differential across that expansion valve so that way we can drive the refrigerant through the valve so it can properly meter the refrigerant and uh, evaporate properly inside the evaporator coil, okay? So with that being said, if we have a really cold ambient temperature outside, our head pressure or our condensing temperature is gonna go down, okay? Because the uh, temperature, the ambient temperature has a direct correlation between the refrigerant temperature also, okay? Because of the, the, the thermodynamic principles, I guess. That's a big word, but... Um, so when the outdoor ambient temperature is really low, then our head pressure is really low. We have to drive that head pressure up. There's a couple different methods we could do. We could do fan cycling. We could do other things too. Um, in this situation, we use condenser flooding. We use a head pressure control valve to flood the condenser, block off the refrigerant flow essentially, okay, and slowly regulate the refrigerant coming out of the valve, drive up the head pressure. But when that happens, we need extra refrigerant or the winter charge to be in the system at all times. In our situation here, our system was about four pounds low on refrigerant. Um, I found a few small leaks, but I definitely want to go back to do a proper leak check, but we got the customer operational, okay? Found a couple of Schrader caps that were missing, different things like that. But anyways, so we found that the system was low on gas. So what was happening was the, the head pressure control valve tried to bypass, but we didn't have the proper winter charge or liquid seal in the receiver. Okay, and so we were feeding vapor refrigerant into the evaporator coil and we were going off on low pressure because of the outdoor ambient temperature. So um, I, and this was one of those situations too where we have this in California a lot because we have really high temperature swings. So 41 that morning, but then we're hitting 90 during the day. So, you know, we can come out during the day and everything will be working fine. But then the customer will call us back the next morning and say, hey, it's not working. If you don't go out in the morning, you'll go back out in the afternoon again, it'll be working fine, you know? And then you're like, what the heck is going on? Well, that's a common symptom. Now, in my situation, it was a little interesting because the outdoor ambient was really high. I saw that cardboard. 
Um, you know, I was kind of thinking, and then the defrost, I didn't know where to go with that one. And it really didn't cross my, I mean, I didn't think we were low on charge, but we ended up being low on charge. Okay. It was, it was, um, it had enough refrigerant to run when it was 60 something degrees outside, but once it hit 40, it fell off the map. Okay. Big picture diagnosis. You know, there's certainly things I could have done to prevent having to go back the next morning, but I was going back anyways. Okay. But you know, um, I could have, uh, checked the receiver level, different things like that, you know, and in, in hindsight, you know, you can always do things better. So, um, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to watch these videos. Hopefully you guys get something from them. Keep in mind, I do live streams. I'll be going live tentatively Monday evening at 5 PM Pacific time. Um, as long as I'm not too busy at work to discuss these videos, to answer all your guys's questions, different things like that. There's also a whole slew of new questions that come into the live streams. So just pay attention to my YouTube channel, Monday evenings, 5 p.m. Pacific. Um, send me an email, hvacrvideos at gmail.com if you guys have any questions. Other than that, we'll catch you guys on the next one, okay?